I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. I started out at a full-time job and I had a side hustle. So now more recently, because I've been so interested in this topic, I have spent the past five years interviewing entrepreneurs who all started what I think are easy to start side hustles. I compile all the results into a book I call the side hustle Bible, which I want to give to you for free. These strategies are tested and proven. You'll see tons of interviews we've done with the entrepreneurs involved. Go to jamesfreebooks.com, see how others have created a profitable side hustle with this free book. All you have to do is go to www.jamesfreebooks.com. That's www.jamesfreebooks.com. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show... I feel to be a successful businessman, meaning to sell a product, mm -hmm. to sell your idea to investors, to sell your company, requires extreme nunchi skills. Yes. Like no one, no one wakes up in the morning and says, I can't wait to give this person hundreds of millions of dollars so they can be fabulously wealthy for right. the rest of their lives. You have to use extraordinary nunchi to yes. show that this is in their agenda as well. So, so Nunchi is, uh, I'll, I'll try to define it and feel free to correct me. Nunchi is basically this enhanced emotional intelligence where you're not only um, kind of internally emotionally intelligent, like in terms of how you deal with situations, but you become extra sensitive when you're in a new situation, how you analyze it, how you analyze the people in the room, right. how you analyze the room itself, and how you then use your emotional intelligence to deal with what you're learning and observing on the fly in real time. Yes. You know, Nunchi isn't just about like, uh, I'm walking in here and people, do they seem nervous? Uh, have they just found out about a family death or, you know, is, is the atmosphere light or heavy? That's sort of a small scale Nunchi. A big scale Nunchi is running a company or a country. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Logistics. Presenting the Delivery Service Partner Program, a new opportunity for business leaders who want to own and operate their own package delivery business. You'll get access to Amazon's logistics training and technology and start building a motivated delivery team in your community. To learn more about becoming an Amazon Delivery Service Partner, go to logistics.amazon.com. So excited I have Yuni Hong with me today. She's the author of The Power of Nunchi. Yuni, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I feel like there's this craze lately uh, where all of these 
Asian concepts like ikigai. Right. And I don't know what Marie, I forgot what Marie Kondo calls her stuff. Uh, she, Konmari method, I think. The, oh, yeah, the yeah. Konmari, but that's related to her name. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, but there's all these, like, you know, uh, concepts that are are being brought here. And, you know, Marie Kondo is kind of about minimalism. Ikigai is about this kind of um, incremental improvements in, in your life. And so, so what I, so, so Nunchi is, uh, I'll, I'll try to define it and, and, and feel free to correct me. Nunchi is basically this enhanced emotional intelligence where you're not only, um, kind of internally emotionally intelligent, like in terms of how you deal with situations, but you become extra sensitive when you're in a new situation, how you analyze it, how you analyze the people in the room, right. how you analyze the room itself, and how you then use your emotional intelligence to deal with what you're learning and observing on the fly in real time. Yes. And so is that, would you say that's the difference? Like, like maybe there's more nuances to what's the differences between Nunchi and just really good emotional intelligence? Right. I mean, I would say Nunchi is a subset of emotional intelligence, but there are two things that make it Nunchi and not just uh, emotional intelligence or somebody having a high EQ. Uh, Nunji emphasizes speed. So in Korea, for example, if somebody is very skilled at Nunji, they don't say that person has great Nunji. They say that person has quick Nunji uh, because adaptability and real-time analysis is considered really important. Um, realizing later that you should have said or done something is good as a life lesson, but it doesn't help you from the situation that you're in now. And, you know, life lessons can be incredibly frustrating. Uh, and the second thing, aside from speed, that makes Nunchi different from regular emotional intelligence is the focus on the room as a whole rather than the person in front of you. Um, and the idea that rooms have emotions and atmospheres and almost their own feelings and that the sum of the parts is, is greater than the whole, or I didn't say that right. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts, rather. Right, which is, I think is right. emotional intelligence doesn't, like just the standard, like I almost see emotional intelligence as a subset of nunchi because uh -huh. it doesn't address the context of the room, the physical space. Right. So emotional intelligence, it seems to me, I, I think, by the way, I think emotional intelligence is not acknowledged as a real intelligence by many, right. you know, psychologists and so on. But in the general ways I hear about emotional intelligence, it's just about whether you know how to deal with complicated interpersonal situations. It doesn't really address what's the physical context I'm in the way you say nun Nunchi does. So right. like, what's an example where the physical context it changes things as opposed to just interpersonal relations. Sure. So uh, let's, when you go into an office or something, every day you're actually kind of entering a different office. Um, and it, it, what I recommend to people is the first thing that you do when you go into a meeting is instead of making a joke or uh, so there's some people who just compulsively make jokes every time they enter a room. And if you think about it, you know exactly the kind of person I'm talking about it. And yeah. it is a weakness. That's what I do, by the way. <laughs> yes, and look look how you turned out. I no. know. <laughs> Thrice divorced. No, twice, twice. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, it's uh, it depends. It depends on the situation, but you're putting yourself at a disadvantage that you don't need to be in. You know, um, you can obviously succeed without Nunchi, but not as well as if you had it. Um, you know, because people, the higher up people are, the more they think they can afford to forget their nunchi, and that's when they start to lose things. Um, Elon Musk created an example of somebody who clearly had nunchi awareness at some point in his career and then kind of got too arrogant to stay connected to his product and his people, and uh, that's the, a nunchi loss. And you can you can succeed without nunchi, but only up to a point. I, I want to get back to the yeah. Elon yeah. Musk example, but then... I, I also want to, um, uh, first off, by the way, what's that sound you think? I was wondering that also. In the, in the oh, okay, so it'll just it's, happen. It's just yeah. elves um, yeah. Yeah, complaining. The New York City elves yeah. that bang on every <laughs> yes. eater. Uh, we don't need to edit this out, by the way. I like having this stuff in. But uh, uh, uh -huh. Nunchi itself, right. I've, I've seen it described uh, as, you know, if you have quick Nunchi, as right. you call it, it's described as a, a, almost like a superpower because yeah. you get into a situation and you and reading in between the lines, you can right. you can do things 
as you mentioned earlier, that you won't regret later. Like you won't say, oh, I should have said this. You'll know immediately what to say and do to maximize the potential of a situation for yourself and perhaps for everybody in the situation. You know, you also mentioned that having good nunchi sort of is contained, it gives good nunchi to the people around you as well. So, so, but on the Elon Musk Uh example, that's an interesting one because I feel to be a successful businessman, meaning to sell a product, Mm -hmm. to sell your idea to investors, to sell your company requires extreme nunchi skills. Like no one, no one wakes up in a more in the morning and says, I can't wait to give this person hundreds of millions of dollars so they can be fabulously wealthy for the rest of their lives. You have to use extraordinary nunchi to, to show that this is a deep, that this is in their agenda as well. And and then you mentioned Elon Musk. He had this one period where he's tweeting, you know, oh, Tesla's going to get bought. He's t- he t- tweeted, he's on a trial right now. He tweeted that pedo quote. Right. Uh, he was on um, the podcast where he was smoking some some pot, yeah. which was against SEC regulations. So w- no matter what you feel about marijuana laws, and I'm in favor of legalizing, that scene in particular cost him money. And... I wonder if that's a situation too where life, you know, maybe he had good, nun- he obviously had good nunchi in, yeah. in general, but, you know, at that time I remember he was having some relationship issues. Maybe something can happen in your life that throws you off. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to what was, whether he was having a bad couple of years, uh, but what does seem to happen in general, and again, I'm not uh, speaking about him in particular. No, is, it's trash. Right. <laughs> Elon, are you listening? Have, Come on the podcast. I, I own to, to no shares this. in Tesla or any. Um, but no, I mean, let's just, well, maybe it would help to have a counterpoint to Elon Musk, which would be Steve Jobs is somebody who had the nunchi and never lost the nunchi. And we lost him very young, so maybe he would eventually have gone the Musk way, but there's no evidence of that. Um, at the beginning of their careers, I would say Jobs and Musk had had similar nunchi levels and were known for similar things, which is... Uh, sort of they understood what the consumer wanted, which is a way, a big picture reading the room skill. You know, Nunchi isn't just about like, uh, I'm walking in here and people, do they seem nervous? Uh, have they just found out about a family death? Or, you know, is, is the atmosphere light or heavy? That's sort of a small scale Nunchi. A big scale Nunchi is running a company or a country, right? Uh, and Steve Jobs was famous for literal, uh, Nunchi means eye measuring, um, measuring. E-Y-E. E-Y-E, not, yeah, not the pronoun. Um, and jo- Jobs was famous for literally just staring down people, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that made them feel, well, A, seen, but also be kind of intimidated, I guess. But he, I don't think it was just posturing to intimidate people. I think he was actually trying to read mm-hmm. people, like, you know, sort of scan them. Um, and everything that Jobs did for Apple, uh, you know, that, that is now considered a triumph that everyone thought was stupid at the time, they were all nunchi moves. Like the design of the iPod, you know, he said, people should be able to access a song in no more than three clicks. You know, that's a direct connection to the user. Anything that's, you know, user-oriented design, that's all nunchi stuff. So, so, so it's like he put himself in yeah. the shoes of the average right. user and knew what they wanted as because there was already mp4 player mp3 right. players um and maybe they were a little bit more complicated he was just like ugh, no it doesn't feel right yeah. i need to just boom 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 and i'm playing my favorite song from my childhood or whatever right right i mean jobs is actually a really good example of how somebody who seems quote unquote bad with people or who seems like he might not be emotionally intelligent actually does have really good nunchi I mean, nunchi doesn't mean that you have to really be liked or sp- specifically pleasant or even really get along with people. You can be as abrasive as you want and have good nunchi too. It's about it's not about making people feel nice and fuzzy. It's about making them feel seen and connected to and understood. And that's why you know that's what made Steve Jobs Jobs. Right. So in, the, in that right. case, he's you. I mean, he created like. He recreated the music industry, right. the movie industry, the phone industry, the computer industry. And you're yes. saying it's because of this understanding of nunchi that yeah. in hindsight seems obvious. Oh, yeah, let's have a nice design and three right. clicks. But nobody was doing it. In hindsight, right. the Macintosh is, mm-hmm. is old news, but nobody was doing the exact kind of nuances that he was doing. Right. Um, what's another example of 
person to person nunchi where you see it as a superpower where like the average person doesn't have this but you've seen an example of superpower like ninja nunchi as you call it well sure i mean in any in any ordinary office if you just think whenever i talk about nunchi i say you know what i'm talking about it if you just sit and think about people in your life who have it and who don't have it and then it becomes immediately clear and in any in any office there are people with good nunchi and bad nunchi and people with good nunchi are the ones who may or may not be more talented than other people or more skilled, but they have something, and it's not really charm. That's, that doesn't get you very far in the long run. It's just more like they're able to pick, they're, they're, they have the best timing, right? They might have this, when you're asking for a raise and all these, there's, there, there are things that are within your control. There are things that are not within your control. And Nunchi is about what's in your control, and that is having the best timing. Um, and so people who seem to always get what they want when somebody else asks exactly the same thing, that's usually somebody with good nunchi. Or even like on a micro level, let's say you have two people, they both have young kids, and one always gets in trouble for going to their kids' plays, and the other one always does the same thing and somehow never gets in trouble, and people ask, oh, how was it? Do you have pictures? And you're like, same situation. Why, why, are, the reception, why is the reception so different? And very frequently, it's a nunchi thing. It's the... It's the moment they chose to ask. It's who they asked. And it's not even that they're... People just assume that there's brown nosing going on, and it's not about being nicer necessarily, because, again, that will get you individual favors but not long-term success. Uh, and, and I think being nicer in the workplace is sometimes... Pe sometimes people... If you don't do it right, people can see through mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. So people will, will almost look down on you mm -hmm. as, as weak. Mm -hmm. not, not weak in a, such a... Uh, Machiavellian way, but they know it's not real. They could sense it, sure, and it doesn't. It, it doesn't. It backfires on you, right? Right. I mean, and Nunchi is. It's not about like you know brown nosing or gland handling. It's finding the right time to strike, and that's the part that people sort of uh, almost recoil at when I talk about Nunchi. Is there is a very pragmatic aspect to it. Uh, it's not all about making people feel good, and I mean, there's a Dale Carnegie, you know the win friends and influence people aspect, but there's also a very strong Machiavellian sort of warrior aspect to it. Uh, yeah, and the, and the way you describe yeah. it, I'm sorry I keep interrupting because you're saying fascinating stuff and I'm just really <laughs> curious. Like you describe some of the basic aspects is you walk into a room and I find it fascinating the way you put it, like be aware that everybody in this room has been here longer than you. Right. So all of the kind of energies and interactions have or they've already happened in this room right. by the time you've walked in. Exactly. And so you have to take a almost like a quick mental step back and sort of figure out even if you know everybody, even if they're all friends, even right. if you've had great personal interactions with everybody, you just have to kind of sense what is uh, the entity of this room now as if it was a single entity and then you re react to that instead of reacting person to person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a, um, in, in Korean, there's a word, punwigi, which means atmosphere, but it refer it's more than an atmosphere. It's like the room's mood, as if the room were a person, like a, uh, you know, like this, this room is like a jolly black giant with lots of city graffiti or something. And, you know, the mood, it, it, it was very hip. And, you know, we're all working, so everyone is hopefully... You have the right balance of happy and tense and relaxed. And, you know, like there's a, there's a perfect storm of, you know, but like if you're in a social situation uh, and you walk into a room, you have to, as the Bible says, read the writing on the wall. Um, Does the Bible actually say that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> As somebody's, some, you know, I, I, maybe, I mean, uh, but uh, something about, uh, yeah, you, know, you know, seeing things, when you walk into a room, if you don't pause to look, it's almost like, imagine you're walking into a room where there's an exam and people are actually showing you the answers and you're not paying attention. You know, being in a, walking into a room where there are already people there is like walking to a room where people are showing you answers to an exam that's already ongoing. You, you, you can gather information as long as you just kind of realize that it's there. Don't immediately make a joke and don't assume. And, you know, plenty of people walk into a meeting and they say, oh, God, is this one of those stupid meetings that George called that could have been handled in an email? And they didn't even bother to look and see whether George was there or not. Right? And there are people who do this all. I mean, I do it sometimes. Everybody does it sometimes. But there are people who do it all the time. And there are people who never do it. It's just all a question, not even just of magical skill or perception. It's just... 
the, the, the magic is in learning how to be quiet and pay attention to the writing on the wall or the fact that people are showing you answers to the metaphorical exam. So where's so, an example where where you've you felt that you've used mm -hmm. quick nunchi. By the way, you always, I like how you describe it as quick versus that uh, great yeah. because it's like you said earlier, again, um, you don't want to regret later. Yeah. You, oh, I should have said this. Having quick nunchi allows you to say the right thing at the right time rather right. than regret later. But what's an example where you've right. used this superpower? I mean, you wrote the book. so right. And and you, you, you feel like the results would have been different than prior times where you didn't use nunchi. Right. Um, well, so one example I could think of is the, a long time ago, there was an office that I worked at that this was during the previous recession. Um, and everyone kind of knew that there were probably going to be layoffs. And uh, for some reason, it occurred to me, I was, I, was wa I was waiting for the elevator and I noticed that there was a sign that's always there saying, in the event of fire, but please use the stairs. This is the name of the local fire department. And these three people are the volunteers in your office who are uh, deputized as fire marshals. It doesn't mean they had to put out fires. It just meant they agreed to go into the toilets and say, there's a fire, everyone get out. And for some reason, I had this epiphany that those three people were going to get, were going to be among the ones getting fired. And it, 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 to me, it was sort of like a joke because it was like a plan words of like the fire marshals are going to get fired. So everyone I told that to thought that I was kidding, but I was actually not kidding. I said, I don't know why. I just think that they're going to get fired. And it has something to do with the fact that they all, they all volunteered to do it. They're, you know, they're very um, raw, raw, but that was part of the problem it was sort of like in that particular office, those were not the values of the office. How, how did you know? Because it was entirely based on spreadsheets. And, you so know, so, so yeah. an employee taking initiative like, okay, I'm um, invested in this company, meaning you know, emotionally right. invested in this company. I, I, I want to be part of the community, so I'm going to be the fire marshal. I'm going to take extra right. uh, duties. That was not valued. That was a misread. That was a misread. And I think it was an overcompensation. It would be like if somebody said, I'm going to make my mark on this, you know, like I'm going like I'm going to join the party committee. I mean, in some offices that I've worked, that would absolutely be a way to wield social and political powers to join the party committee. And in other offices, no. I mean, if you're working for Steve Jobs, probably no. Right. <laughs> you know, um and And how did you yeah. pick up on this these nuances? Um I, to me they were obvious. Mm -hmm. Uh it was just sort of like, you know, if people if, if there are a lot of people who um, um, sort of do things from computer and FaceTime isn't considered important and, you know, any kind of sort of, you know, poop, amateur people dress down a lot and there are a lot of telecommuters and so forth, that it tends to be very numbers oriented. You know, if you read the weekly CEO report, which everyone would just delete because it's boring, they'll actually tell you what their values are, you know. Um, and you know, to me, it was obvious that it was a very bottom line oriented company. And that people who did things that in high school would have made them popular actually made them lose respect in this particular And, and I remember, in the, yeah. you write about this in the book, so those fire marshals actually did end up getting mm -hmm. laid off. And when they went around and asked for new volunteers for fire marshals, yeah. you specifically did not I volunteer. said no. And they said, if you thought I was kidding, I said, no, no, I, I really, I, I, if there's a fire, uh, the first thing I will save is this keyboard and this mug. <laughs> and, and nobody so that's using, else. Yeah. That's using Nunchi, though, to <laughs> save the property of the work as opposed to the people. <laughs> no, so I just, I just, I, I didn't, and then, and then, so they hired, they picked three more people and for the volunteer fire marshal, two of the three people also got fired. And this all happened within months of each other. So it was bad Nunchi to volunteer. It was bad Nunchi to not notice what the people who got fired had in common, you know. And I'm not saying, wow, I'm so smart. I'm just saying, actually, it was all there. Um, and, you know, it was just a question of paying attention to the signals that everyone was already giving every day, you know, because everyone knows, oh, well, if my boss is in a good mood today, then I can ask for a raise. But Nunchi, again, doesn't just mean that individual that day. It, it's a global thing. It means, you know, yeah, your boss might be in a good mood, but didn't you just go to this meeting where uh, there, there was a, there was a graph and the the graph was going down, <laughs> sloping downward? It doesn't matter if the boss is in a good mood. You're not reading the overall atmosphere of the company. Also, the but, boss being in a good mood might be a negative sign. 
because yes. he's not going to be in a he's not going to show right uh, uh you know overtly that he's in a bad mood right before he fires people <laughs> he's just right. he's going to keep everyone calm and then right. i just think that would be the normal tendency of most bosses i don't know but well yeah yeah i mean and that's the number one reason that people need nunchi is that you know if I tell you, oh, 80% of communication is nonverbal, you're going to roll your eyes most likely because we've all heard it and it just seems really stupid and, you know, what are we supposed to do about it? But, you know, I mean, you see you see this at work every day and, I mean, at work figuratively and also in the office every day where um, nobody is saying what they're thinking. So, of course, it's 80% nonverbal. Well, I, I, I have kind of proof of it, which is that the podcasts I do, and I, I I do all the podcasts in person, like like we're doing right now. But when I used to do podcasts, let's say over the phone, this is years ago. Uh-huh. Uh, those podcasts got significantly less downloads than the ones in person. I, yeah. I I happened to have done one the first year or second year in right. person, and that had spiked the number of downloads because it was more shared yeah. by people. So it was clearly like in person, there was more communication that was happening and le- led to a better discussion and 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 it was more entertaining more educational and so on so people shared it yeah 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 so that's kind of proof that more was happening non-verbally than than people suspect sure but but like so here, so let me ask you like some and then i want to go through your 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 rules of nunchi which uh-huh. was fascinating but like let me just ask you some random situations like let's say it's thanksgiving we just passed yeah. thanksgiving and you walk into a room of family uh-huh. and suddenly you you sense slight discomfort like maybe they were just talking about you um that's what that's the first thing that comes to mind uh is where where does nunchi play a role in here like like how, how do you how do you trust your observations what do you what do you look for what do you do next and so on cuz that's maybe a common situation in my life so i want to know <laughs> right well, I mean, first I would say if you, 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 it's everyone's right to avoid a situation where they have to use so much nunchi that it gives them a migraine. Like if if if, if a situation no you know is going to require tons and tons of nunchi, and it can be avoided, I always say it's okay to avoid it. But in a situation, so, so that wait, yeah. wait, I'm sorry, that's yeah. interesting. So yeah. nunchi in in general becomes a superpower when the when the stakes are higher in a situation. Yes. So yeah, ideally. Yeah. You don't want the stakes to be so high in every situation in your life where right. you have to like use this this power. Right. I mean, it's like money or energy or anything else. Everything is finite, and if you use it in this context, that you don't have enough later for this other context. So, choose your situations wisely. And nunchi is a very good proxy for is this situation worth it? Mm. You know, because nunchi is energy, and if you need to use it, great. If you don't, then it's it's really okay to avoid certain situations. But if you're a family situation or anything where you're kind of, you know, uh, sort of in a habitual situation and some of the people want to be there, some people don't want to be there. Um, w- one reason that people have cyclical arguments in, in, a, in a Thanksgiving situation is, well, there are several reasons. One is they have these assumptions that it's going to happen. And, you know, this is sort of a, this is like, a, this is a type of prejudice. And that's why in the book I say that one of the important things about Nunchi is to abandon prejudices, which is very hard, you know. And it doesn't just mean prejudice with respect to race and religion. It means don't go in assuming that there's going to be a fight because but every other person is probably assuming that too and then you just end up playing this this role like you're being puppeteered or something. Um, and the other thing that's very important is that if there's a cyclical argument, whether it's with a family member or you know a loved one or a best friend, if it, it does, you have the same argument every three months and you don't know why and it's almost scripted, uh, it's usually because one or both parties uh, is unable or unwilling to say exactly what they're thinking. And the other person knows this and either says to them, use your words, or is thinking, I'm not a mind reader. This is exasperating. I'm in the right here because that person is not communicating. Um, mm. So Yeah, that happens a lot. <laughs> yes. Well, that's not fair because, I mean, yes, it would be great if somebody said, you know, it really hurts me when I read ever blah, 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 and uses I statements and says – hey, I'm hungry, let's eat, instead of saying, are you hungry? I'm wondering if people are hungry. I mean, it would be great if people did that, but people don't always feel comfortable expressing their feelings. Um, some of it might just be upbringing, and some, in some extreme cases, it might be uh, if, if you live in an abusive household, people like that generally are very averse to ever saying exactly what's on their mind because that was punished behavior. Um, and that's, that can be hard to change. And 
you can't judge people for not being comfortable saying exactly what's on their mind. It's not, it's an extreme cultural bias to say, use your words. I really hate it when people say that. Um, so, so you're saying then the key is if you sense any yeah. tension at all mm -hmm. um, and you say to yourself, well, he didn't or she didn't say, yeah. you know, X, Y, Z. So I'm just going to go on what she says. That might be wrong. Nunchi, that's using this kind of right. cultural bias, which is roughly man-made as opposed to this gut right. instinct. And, and maybe uh, a solution, a nunchi solution might right. be, uh, you, you talk about labeling in another context, yeah. but a, a nunchi solution might be to, to label what is, given that this is high stakes, given that yeah. he or she just said something, label, tr think as an exercise, what did she actually say? Or what, what are the range of things she might mean? Right. Well, that's actually, no, that's a very good response. Um, you know, and just basically looking beyond the words and thinking, okay, I mean, just very pragmatically speaking, if you don't do any, if somebody doesn't do something differently, you will never have a different outcome. You can't force another person to do something differently. So you have to do something differently, even if you don't think it's your responsibility. Um, forcing somebody to use their words is not going to work. You have to look beyond the words. Right, and that's all that Nunchi is. You might not get to the bottom of it, but you know, if you realize, if, just stop being so lawyerly in your communication. You know, and people mm. are very like, "Well, you said blah blah blah," like that was a binding agreement, or you didn't specify. Oh, I, I love doing that. I'm gonna have to stop doing that. <laughs> well, only if you want people to like you. <laughs> well, that's the thing about Nunchi is that, um, I mean, in Korean culture, and Nunchi is an example of this. Things that you do by accident are. If to harm you caused by accident is almost as bad as harm that you cause on purpose. And people just recoil at this idea. You know, if, if you have good intentions, shouldn't you be rewarded for that? I mean, yes, in the like next life, maybe. I mean, if you want good person points, you know, yes, then you get points for being a good person for having good intentions. But pragmatically speaking, no, your intentions don't matter at all. If somebody embarrasses you every time you're with them, if they annoy you, um, whether it's intentional or not, you just kind of don't want to be around them. And even worse for them, you're not going to explain why. So they'll go through their whole lives with people just noticing maybe people don't like being around them and no one will ever tell them why because they're like, well, it's not intentional, so I feel really bad. So it's almost worse if it's accidental harm right. rather than... Because you have no yeah. way to kind of correct yourself. Yeah. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. I hate going to my local bank's office and dealing with the tellers and all the cubicles and everything else, like when I have any kind of issues. So that's why I love this new sponsor, Axos Bank. Axos provides simple, convenient, hassle-free banking. Axos is so confident in their basic business checking account, they'll give you $50 to try it out. Here's how you get it. You use promo code James at axosbank.com slash James, and Axos is spelled A-X-O-S. Go to axosbank.com slash James today to get started. They are 100% digital, much lower overhead costs than traditional banks, so they pass those savings on to their customers, which means no maintenance fees, no minimum balance requirements, unlimited domestic ATM fee reimbursements, your first 50 checks for free, and up to 200 free transactions per month on their basic business checking account. Axos lets you access your money anytime, anywhere. Their time-saving digital tools allow you to check your accounts, make deposits, and pay bills wherever you are. Stay ahead of the challenges of modern business with a bank that works for you. Visit AXOSBank, axosbank.com slash James to learn more and get your $50. Axos Bank, small business banking simplified. You know, here's this is a, an interesting thing. Like, if you ask somebody, if you ask anybody on the street, yes. do you feel like you're above average with emotional intelligence? Probably almost, probably nine <laughs> out of ten will say they're above above average on that. And you right. refer to the Dunning Kruger bias, which is related to this. Everyone thinks they're better than they are at right. whatever. And uh, how do you how do you correct that? Because we all have this this bias. Uh -huh. So how do you? I, I guess just thinking out loud, one way is uh -huh. is instead of wondering where I stand in terms of Nunchi, uh -huh. just trying to get better at it wherever I am. Sure. Um, I mean, the, yeah, the Dunning-Kruger, yeah, so, no, the Dunning-Kruger Dunning effect, for those who don't know, is the fact that people who are stupid 
don't know that they're stupid because they're too stupid, right? Right. Um, but this happens so, like somebody right. who's yeah. somebody who is a painter, like yeah. on, on these very subjective, right. you know, uh, measures. Right. Someone painting, there's no objective measure if someone's a good artist or not. Right. Somebody might easily be fooled into thinking that they're better than they are. If someone's an entrepreneur right. and they're developing their product, they might think their product's going to be a lot more exciting to people than it really will be. You know, that's why a lot of businesses fail. Sure, sure. Or, you know, first round American Idol auditions, you know, where there's the, the, the they specifically pick people who are not just bad, but who think that they're really good. Because it's not funny if someone's a bad singer. It's funny if they think that they're like Pavarotti and they're a really bad singer. Um, and it's that drop off you know, the, the discrepancy that makes people, you know, very, you know, doubt themselves. Um, so, I mean, Nunchi is a way of combating this and everybody has biases. You know, they both inflate things that they think that they're, they think they're, they're better than things they are. And there's also like, like body dysmorphia, but in a more general sense where they hyper-focalize on one thing that they think is bad about themselves and they think that everyone can see it. So uh, all of this is what Nunchi is for. It's to sort of get, um, just focus on data collection rather than this, this sort of endless uh, sort of dynamic of, but, but then they perceive it this way, you know, by their perception, my perception, because it's sort of like a house of mirrors or something like that. But it's hard to focus on data collection, I think, yeah. because I'm, let's say I walk into a room and I've uh -huh. done, been walking into a room billions of times and I have uh, my particular way of doing things. Yeah. Of course, I could say, oh, I'm going to try to get the power of Nunchi here. I'm going to take a step back, observe each person, observe mm -hmm. the, the scenery. What is this room? What's, yeah. what's supposed to be happening here? What's not? Mm -hmm. But I could still think to myself, I did it. I, I did it. Um, but I might not be really doing it. <laughs> so right. how do you, how do you, well, well, this might be a good time to right. go over what the, what the rules, <laughs> the eight yeah. rules of Nunchi and, and sure. talk about them and then some ways of getting better at each one. So you say, uh, the num rule number one, first, Empty your mind. Lose your preconceptions in order to observe with discernment. So that's hard to empty your mind because you it's walk really into hard. a situation with huge biases, cultural biases, family right. biases, biases about each person in the room right. and so on. Right. Um, yeah, it's probably the hardest thing there is to do, which is why you know every single spiritual belief system requires some form of either prayer or meditation. These are all brain silencing activities uh, and it's 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 probably the hardest thing that there is to do but it's it's not so much that you shut it down because you can't actually shut it down uh, it's more that you plug into you plug your body into your environment your five step by body I mean five senses so sort of surpass the cerebral cortex and go back to more instinctive uh, you know hearing seeing, feeling, smelling. You know. So trying not to judge anything happening. You, and you give, right. and, and the book is so valuable because you you do give like some exercises, like you have some breathing exercises that help yeah. kind of distract the senses right. a little bit. Um, that's where you also have the, uh, ex the idea of running cold water on your hands first before entering sure. into a high stakes situation because that detaches your body a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I guess you're, you're trying to not have a gut impression at first, right? In this case, right? I mean, I, I it sounds stupid to say the brain is the enemy, but the brain is kind of the enemy. I mean, roughly speaking, you know, we are told that there are three parts of the brain. There's the the neocortex, which is the big, big part of the brain in the human, um, and uh, and then there's the limbic brain, which is the amphibian brain, which controls emotions, blah blah blah. And then we have the reptilian brain, which is the most primitive brain that just is about like, you know, survival. Um, and um, you know, as humans, we devalue the older parts of the brain and we value entirely this big you know, this cerebral cortex that gives us language and music and art and all those good things. Uh, but it is the biggest part of the brain. It is also the youngest part of the brain, brain rather, but it thinks that it is the smartest. It's the youngest. Those kids it, these days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's this. It's it's the youngest, and it thinks it's the wisest. Uh, and we and it is and it's just it creates a lot of noise and it attaches. It detaches your brain is like basically detaching your body from the room that you're in, um, which makes it impossible to read the room. So would you say data collection is not about like okay, this person's thinking to yourself, this person's smiling, this wall is red, this the 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 speaker phone is on, mm -hmm. blah blah blah. Is it more just like? observing and not trying to put words to it and yes. not coming up with 
Uh, like I could see someone following this advice and saying, oh, I'm going to be like Sherlock Holmes and uh -huh. I'm going to do this, this, and this. Maybe not verbalizing any conclusions right. yet and just seeing what what your observation, where your observations take you automatically without without in right. intellectualizing it. No, exactly. You know, just sort of, you can observe without expecting immediate dramatic results. Right. You know, you could just sort of get a sense of things. Um, you know, you, when you, you at a very basic level, if you go to a funeral, you you probably will sense that people are sad and you shouldn't be making jokes. Uh, I mean, everyone can do this sometimes without thinking, oh, what is, I wonder what it means that that woman is crying at a funeral. Well, you can probably guess. You know, it's you just don't don't try to say say what does this mean? What does this mean? Just sort of take it in as a feeling uh, first, and that's what I mean by data collection. I don't mean this, therefore. You know, X, X, X and Y conditions are met, and therefore, uh, this, this, it must be situation Z or whatever. That's not. Yeah, it's it's more just taking in rather than stringing together. Right. So so again, just absorbing, mm -hmm. and then and then it goes feeds into the second rule, which is be aware of the nunchi observer effect. Yes. And you capitalize nunchi observer and effect. When you enter a room, you change the room. Understand your influence. So that's like the room where everyone's talking and you enter and they suddenly right. stop talking. You just change the room by your presence. Yeah. And it seems like the more you change the room, chances are the more high stakes this this room situation, this particular situation is for you. Yes, yes. I mean, if you walk into a room, whether people change their behavior or not, you're, you're subtly changing the room. You know, so like we're sitting here, somebody came in, whether they were just you know, checking to see if it needed cleaning or whether they were to tell us something. There's, it would change the atmosphere no matter what, even if they didn't say anything. So you always have to realize that you're doing that too anytime you enter a room. Um, so you don't have to tell a joke. You don't have to make a big song and dance. Uh, I really just recommend st literally standing at the threshold. And, um, you know, what do I, I, I really like the tradition of the mezuzah. And I wish that everyone did that. You know, for those who don't know, it's the scroll. It's a, it's 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 a shema. You know, there's a scroll that people that, that, that people uh, certain observant Jews put on their um, door frame, and that you kiss it when you go in. And it's a and you do that whether there's anyone in the room or not, right? Um, and this is a way of honoring the room, hmm. right? And even if you're not religious, I think that the idea of kissing a mezuzah when you enter a room is a very nunchiful act. You know, you don't have to, you're not expecting God to appear in the room because you kiss the mezuzah or any kind of magic whatsoever. You don't go, where's my reward? You know, it's just a way of pausing before you enter a room as a way of honoring it and the people who are in it and the fact that it has its own soul, its and, own, yeah. Good. And I, I never, I never really thought of it that way it's, it, as opposed to ritualistic, but you're right. It's a way of pausing mm -hmm. that helps you too, in terms of like yeah. just slowing you down, yeah. stopping your preconceptions and yeah. so on. It's a pause. Um, yeah. Rule number three, if you just arrived in the room, remember that everyone else has been there longer than you. Watch them to gain information. So, so that's important. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just skip through and, re and read these rules. Never pass up a good opportunity to shut up. If you wait long enough, most of your questions will be answered without you having to say a word. I love that because, for instance, in negotiations, yeah. it's often very hard. Silence is often uncomfortable. It's often very hard to say something like, well, I want a $5 raise. Yeah. And then they say nothing, but then you should say nothing like, and let them fill in the gap. Right. I mean, you you know, you're a you're a man of commerce, so you know this that if people who can't be silent are at a, it's a huge handicap. Right? Because if um you know, I know somebody who negotiated a raise uh and did it entirely by not saying anything, which the boss was not prepared for at all because the boss had this script, you know, in her mind about like, okay, He's going to say this, and I'm going to say, but you just started. And then he's going to say this, and I'm going to say that. But the one thing the boss was not prepared for was the guy saying nothing. You know, he just said, you know, I would like a raise. And, um, and you know, so she, the, the boss didn't really know what to do. And she kept babbling and saying, okay, well, is this about the cost of living increase that everyone got because you started in the fourth quarter and that's, and then he was like, whoa, I didn't know there was a cost of living increase, but okay, thanks. You know, and the conversation kept going like that. The boss could not be quiet and kept showing her hand and kept showing her hand and accidentally revealed how much this person's manager was making in the course of explaining why she couldn't give this much of a raise and basically accidentally gave the exact range that the person could ask for. 
you know, and people do this all the time, whether you're buying a house or whatever, you know, if you, uh, if you talk too much, you will reveal your whole hand. And the same thing with interviewing for a job. And people always, or, you know, or a first date, people always think they want to show how great they are and they forget that the other person is basically giving them, like, again, if, you're, if you let the other person talk, it's like they're going to show you the answers to the test. You don't have to really talk as much as you think you need to. It's, it's so interesting. Like, in real estate, people, there's the kind of cliche scene in a movie where um, <sighs> somebody thinks they're a good negotiator in real estate and they say, well, the faucet is a little leaky and the view not so, like the, the customer is talking right. too much. Whereas the real estate agent's only goal really is to sell a house. Right. He gets his commission. It's not that much different no matter what the price is. Yeah. So you kind of just want to say, well, you, know, you kind of just want to leave it open-ended. Well, what do you suggest yeah. here? And let them talk and be quiet throughout. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. I mean, and, and we know this, but in, in in the moment, it's very hard to be quiet. That's why That's why people are addicted to their phones because it's just a socially acceptable way of shutting people out that we've been waiting for. Or, or, you know, and finally we have an invention that allows us to do this uh, in, in, a, in a way that's considered okay. I, I agree with you. Like one time I was at a restaurant and I saw a, a table filled with like 12 or, or more kids, mm -hmm. uh, kids being like teenagers or young people in their young 20s. Right. And every now and then, at any given point, two or three of the kids would just be like withdrawn a little and looking at their phone. I actually think that's a great thing. Like some people don't want to be in a intense conversation with 12 people for four straight hours. <laughs> Let them take breaks sometimes. Look at their phone. It's not such a bad thing. Well, I mean, you could take a break, but... Um... You could also, I mean, how is looking at your phone taking a break? Well, taking a break from that situation is like oh, escapism. Well, sure. I mean, but, you know, I mean, obviously, if you're in a situation that you don't want to be, that's fine. But uh, why, why are people checking their phones while crossing the street? Oh, yeah, that's you a good know? point. Or, I mean, it's... Because they want to die? <laughs> well, according to Freud, we all want to die. <laughs> We're born wanting to die. So, so it could be that, but... So, um... You talked about if you cause harm un unintentionally, it sometimes is bad. Uh, read between the lines. We talked about that. We talked about be nimble, be quick. Yeah. Uh, just as a quick summary, this is on page seventy-eight of the the Power of Nunchi, uh, that you know by by you, uh, and and you give at, at the end of the book too. I want to recommend you give some games like the Nunchi game yeah. and this other game that I think are really great for practicing Nunchi. And I've I've seen some other versions of these games that really rely on people's ability to read others. Yeah. But what are some, and then, and then we'll have to, to wrap it up. I want to be respectful of your time. But what are some very like quick ways to immediately practice nunchi? I want to practice nunchi like in the next half hour. <laughs> um, poker? Yeah. And I noticed, <laughs> by the way, you quote our very yeah. good friend, uh, Maria Konnikova. In oh, here. I love was, her. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And she's written about Sherlock Holmes, which yes. she mentioned in the book, and she's also writing about poker now. Yeah. Uh, and she has a lot of... what I've never seen her say what you mentioned in, in your book that I thought it was fascinating to not look at the obvious things that everyone else looks at, but look at the other the other things that people aren't looking at. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, that's what... Because uh, you know, Maria Konnikova is, like, is a professional poker player. And she says, everyone thinks that they know how to tell. A tell. I mean, this, and, and, I mean, everyone has to tell, but it's not what you think it is, is basically what she's saying. And that ties into what I'm saying about Nunchi, which is abandoning your prejudices. Don't assume that, you know, uh, if somebody is playing with their ear, that it means this, you know, because, okay, I mean, that that won't get you very far. It's not about specific things. It's not about what your your what your prejudice to assume are signs. It's about paying attention to the whole person. No, sorry, the whole table, actually, the whole room. Like when you go to, I mean, I like to compare, if you want to do a nunchi exercise, pretend that you're watching a play instead of just talking to a person. Um, if you're watching a play, you don't just focus on one or two people. You look mm. at the whole stage, otherwise you're losing context. Right, and do the same, the same thing when you enter a room. I mean, as as Shakespeare said, you know, all the world is a stage, and the men and the men and women are are, are merely players. And that's basically he, he, that's what he was saying is that everyone is is there for a reason. Take in the whole stage, uh, and same with poker. You don't just watch what one person is doing; you watch what everyone is doing. It's a dynamic. Well, also, you make an interesting point. Like uh -huh. a lot of times, uh, again, a lot of these things have to do with 
cliches about yes. situations and environments. So you mentioned the they they tugging their ear, or in the movie mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. poker rounders, like he he messes with an Oreo cookie every time he has a he's bluffing. Right. Sometimes a tell is not a specific action. Right. It goes back to what you were saying with the reptilian brain. Yeah. Sometimes if you are really paying attention and observe a lot, right. you can't put a word to the tell, but you just right. feel uh I feel like he doesn't have as good a hand as he's right. representing. Now what what you also talk in the book a little bit, and this is this will be the the final question. But you talk in the book about so we sometimes we should trust our first or gut yeah. impressions. Mm -hmm. uh, when, but and yet, like everybody thinks they're a good judge of character, and everybody thinks they have good yes. first impressions. I don't think that about myself. <laughs> I think I have often very poor impressions, particularly in high stakes situations. So when should you know to trust your first impression? Right, well, this is sort of the dilemma because on the one hand, I mean, the gut is called the second brain for a reason. Um, and Deepak Chopra says something that I really love, which is the body is very intelligent. And to me, that's the that's exactly, I, I, I think that's true and a lot of people don't play that. On the other hand, people say, well, I followed my gut and look what happened. Well, I mean, I think people are confusing different parts of their body. You know, um, um, if you... Uh, like I said, the cerebral cortex is what confuses people, makes them make huge, huge mistakes. It's the thing that creates prejudice, uh, uh, not not you know just general prejudice and also um, systemic prejudice. That does you know that's that comes from overthinking things and making associations that aren't real, uh, because the human brain has a tendency to think in a previous situation X led to Y. Therefore, in all situations X leads to Y. That's not a reptilian instinct. That's a it's a that's a that's a cerebral cortex instinct. Uh, and these all these these desires and um, readings come from different parts of the body. And I think that if you're getting a feeling that comes from your gut and it is a correct feeling, it feels different in the body. It feels cold and hard like a fact, whether it's great news or bad news. Like if you think about like when I found out like a cousin of mine had died, you know, I just felt, it just felt like a fact, you know, whereas something that is, that your cerebral cortex is jumping on will feel hot. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Is that my phone? That's okay. Can, <laughs> can, nice you, can you edit that out or get me the, I'll start over. We, we, we don't edit out mistakes. Oh, no. so that's, okay. that's fine. <laughs> Your phone did not read the room correctly. <laughs> I'm so sorry. My, my, um, what I was saying was, uh, oh, it comes. Uh, instincts come from different parts of the body, and anything that's from the gut that is correct will feel cold. But like, hard. like, let's yeah, say, so. let's say you're thinking of doing business with somebody, and let's say they have some form of Asperger, so. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the conversations you have with almost yeah. everyone else, the conversations with this person feels a little awkward. Like you're not quite sure where you stand in the conversation, so you feel bad. About, right. Like, my gut might be, don't do business with this person, and yet they might be very good at what they do. It's just I misread their Asperger somehow. Oh, I see. Um, I'm taking an extreme right. example. So you you mean you feel bad because uh, they give you. They just leave you with a bad feeling about working with them or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like I think the communication wasn't like a normal communication. Oh, oh yeah. Um, again, I would say, well, if the communication isn't good, then you probably shouldn't do business with them. <laughs> but if you just mean like, is your bad feeling enough to dismiss somebody? Um, I, I guess, I guess, yeah. There's probably right. even nuances in that that you yeah. could practice paying attention to. Right. I mean, one way, one. I, I wonder if you think this right. is a good exercise. Like, just with each person you meet today. Yeah. Try, you know, try to come up with some gut assumptions and yeah. see if they're correct somehow. I don't know how you test if they're correct, but but try and, you know, practice that more and more might be a good technique. Um, gut is, well, I, I mean, I guess, it, it, I, I would do it in a context where you have more than one interaction with them, yes, like in a room. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily do it with people that you run into on the street or, Yes. a clerk or something but yeah i mean next time you're in a very i would i would practice in a very ordinary situation before a high stakes one yeah so all right well yuni hong author of the power of nunchi it's so interesting because i do feel like this is emotional intelligence squared because it's not just about like oh what do i do when she says this what do i do when he says right. this it's more about like the whole room yes the context the energy of the room your health because you probably 
have to be healthy and creative and so on to yeah. to be able to do these techniques. Uh, you also wrote The Birth of Korean Cool, which I think is a fascinating topic too, which we'll have to talk about at yes, another time. The idea that, that um, somehow South Korea went from nothing to being the coolest country in the world. <laughs> you know, K-pop is, is huge right. all over the world. And I just read that um, South Koreans uh, have more photos saved on their phone by far than any other country. And I was curious if that was related, but we will save that for <laughs> the next, we'll have you on again, I'll save that for the next time. Yeah. But I, I strongly recommend people read The Power of Nunchi and understand the, the, the concept of, you know, to, to basically pause when entering into a situation, be quiet, observe, practice letting that reptilian mind, you know, help you form your, your instincts and, and don't assume you, you have good emotional intelligence. Like <laughs> always remind yourself that you probably don't have as good as you think. So thanks so much, Uni, for coming on the podcast. Thank you. It was really fun. Thank my, you. My, my nunchi here is that you would like to stay on the podcast longer, but I know you have your next uh, thing to go to. So that is a good read. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Bye. Sorry about the phone. Oh, my God. No, that's okay. Hold it right there. I have something for you. I'm giving away copies of my new book, The Side Hustle Bible. I'm not even selling this on Amazon. I only want you guys to get it for free. We, we've interviewed hundreds of entrepreneurs about all of their different side hustles, and I picked out the ones that I think everybody could start on the side. There's 177 proven opportunities to turn a hobby or existing skills into an entirely new source of income. And you can't get this anywhere else. All 177 ideas are inside this totally free book, and I've reserved a copy for you. All you have to do is go to www.jamesfreebooks.com. That's www.jamesfreebooks.com. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.